Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to your first or another session of Jewelry Ecom Live. I'm Caroline Stanley, one of the organizers of the conference. We'll be having a great Q&A at the end of today's session, so make some notes along the way. This session features Gus Garcia of Bottom Line Marketing. His presentation is The Marketing Mix, Tailored Strategies for Independent Retail Jewelers. Thank you for the introduction, Caroline, and hello to everyone. Thank you so much for taking time out of your busy day to, uh, to join us. We appreciate it. Cool. And, and I'm gonna share my screen here in a second. Um, just wanted to speak to everyone quickly. Uh, again, thank you so much for joining us. Um, I'm really excited about the opportunities we have to talk about all the different variables and how things have changed in the last 12 months, um, specifically over the last two year trajectory of so many anomalies. Um, so many people did so well, so many people did not do so well. Um, what caused these changes? What caused these fluctuations? And what can we do to kind of, you know, roll with the punches and show some growth? So um, with that said, um, I figured I'd spice it up a little bit by wearing a bow tie. I typically don't work from home with a bow tie on, but um, I felt uh, the need to rise to the occasion. So, um, you know, just pretend we're all in some, uh, very nice, comfortable conference right now, eating really good food and listening to uh, um, some cool stuff. So <laughs> with that being said, um, let's dive right into it. I will forewarn you guys, I do have a Corgi named Charlie. He does like to say hello sometimes. So apologies in advance if he does that, um, but he's a lot better looking than I am. So I'm sure no one will mind the uh, interruption here. So um, cool. With that being said, I'm going to share my screen now. Caroline, I think I might, um, oh no, I'm all set. All right, so let's dive right into it here. And minimize that, bring you down here. Cool, and we should be good to go. Um, so let's dive right into it. The marketing mix, tailored strategies for independent retail jewelers. Um, I will, by the way, share some contact info afterwards in case you guys would like to follow up with any further discussion that you know we may or may not have time to cover in our Q&A session. We'll also give you a little reminder about 30 minutes in, um, just so you can make sure you get all your questions in through the chat box. And then um, Caroline and I will feel those accordingly uh, with the time that we have. So let's dive right into it. Figured when we talk about the media mix, people always jump into this like binary relationship between traditional and digital. And the first question is, well, should I be doing 100% digital? Should I be doing 100% traditional? Um, and always pinning one against each other. Um, that type of polarization doesn't really work in our opinion when it comes to your media budget. So, and just to back up real quick, everything I'm talking about right now is really tailored and centered and focused around the independent retail jeweler. A lot of what we talk about, although catered to that independent retail jeweler does apply to brands, um, specifically uh, up and coming brands are really trying to make a, a, a dent in the market um, through an online presence. Um, but just want to make sure we clarify who our audience is. And obviously, I think that goes without saying um, with the context of the, of, of the conference, but um, just figured it's good to put a gauge on that. So with that being said, traditional and digital, a binary relationship. So often at times we have independent retailers asking us um, why we should be doing one over the other, rather than how can we find a, um, I guess, symbiotic relationship between the two where they both benefit each other and really enhance the overall strategy. Um, so we're going to talk about both digital and traditional today. However, because of the, I guess, state of the union, so to say, when it comes to the economy and how the industry has gone um, towards more of a shift uh, towards online consumer behavior, specifically over the last year, leading questions from our clients and, and pros prospective clients are, well, what's working within the digital space? Um, if I am doing little to nothing in digital, where do I start? What's working for your current clients from whether it's a million dollar store looking to become a $5 million store or a $20 million store looking to become a $50 million store and everything in between. So here are just based off uh, 2020 activity, um, just a couple starting points that we would really recommend and, and a little bit of a case study analysis on what's worked for our clients as, as an agency that focuses on digital. So Google shopping, and the importance of setting up a product feed correctly is at the top of our list. 
Um, Google Shopping is the e-com component for Google. So Google, as you all know, is the end all be all when it comes to um, you know, any question that mankind has had over the last 20 years, basically. Um, it could be answered by Google's algorithms. Um, Google allows us to deliver ads to people literally a split second after they search for a product or service that we provide as advertisers. So if I'm a big bridal store, I could get in front of a consumer that's in market for bridal in the same moment that they just inquired on a bridal product. So we talk about Google Shopping being the e-com component to this massive search network that Google has set up. Um, with more and more consumer behavior shifting towards online, I do wanna preface that although we do strongly believe in adding the Google Shopping component to any and all advertising that you're doing, if you have a website, if you have product online, you should be spending some type of budget allocated towards Google Shopping. We set it with the same expectation that if you did 90% of your revenue or 95% of your revenue in store transactions, your Google shopping isn't going to flip that. You're still going to be predominantly a brick and mortar or brick to click as they call it, where you do have some type of online presence, but really the transactions are mostly ending up in the store. What the Google shopping does, if not complete the transaction online is provide a fair, a fair price point and a good point of purchase to get the consumer in that buying mode, whether or not they actually complete that transaction online or call your store, set up an appointment from that same product page and then continue that transaction working with one of your talented sales reps. What we've seen with Google shopping as an ideal price point for online products is between 1500 to $2,000. Anything below that, you're, it's going to have to be a very high volume sale funnel. And um, it's, it's not typically something that we're writing home about, but anything above that is where you're going to get that billboard effect of the Google shopping ad, maybe not closing that transaction online, but instead of a $1,500 piece, let's say it's a $5,000 piece, that Google shopping ad is going to begin the process. And rather than just seeing a text ad on, on Google search, talking about why your jewelry store is the best place to buy this, uh, you know, let's say tennis bracelet. Um, now you're going to have an actual picture of the product, high res image with a price point and an easy way for them to, if not buy it online, again, get in contact with your store. The second part to this bullet point is the product feed and making sure that's set up correctly. Um, your product feed is something that we put together between your point of sale software and your back end CMS. So like your, your, your content management system on your website. We create what's called a Google Merchant Center account through Google that allows us to take product from your point of sale software to your website and then into an ad platform. So we're actually able to take that product that's on your site, again, from your point of sale software and deliver it in an ad format to people when they search for that product on Google. That's what your product feed does. There's a lot of things that could go wrong with your product feed. If you've ever updated product on your site, whether or not you've taken that next step and tied it to an ad platform, you already know all the things that could go wrong. So it is, is kind of, um, which is why we make it such a focus to set up correctly from the first time around. So we don't have to go back and, and kind of double up on uh, what could be a very painstaking process, to be honest. Um, the best ways to avoid having a product feed set up incorrectly or many of the headaches that could come with that is making sure you pick a good partner when it comes to managing the back end of your site. Um, us as an agency, we have a couple preferred partners in the industry. We don't really pride ourselves on building websites for retail jewelers. We make sure we manage more of the marketing and advertising and clienteling aspect of it. Um, so we choose partners to work with, and I'm more than happy to you know, answer questions about who we recommend um, afterwards in our Q&A, if you like. But essentially find someone you could trust, find someone that does a good job, um, vet them out through um, references and other jewelers similar to yours in the industry that use them. If you have a good web company, it's gonna provide you good service and, and work efficiently on your back end. Um, then none of this should be a problem. Um, the only concern is that sometimes finding companies like that could be few and far between. <laughs> um, so uh, I'm sure some of you have already had your fair share of frustrations with that and we're more than happy to, again, talk about our recommendations after the fact. Here are just some, um, some more, uh, a little more content to kind of back up what we were talking about. Um, there's a visual on your left. That's what your Google shopping ads look like. It is actually the only form of 
uh, display ads within a search network. So typically when you see a display ad, it's, it's a graphic ad with some type of animation. You're seeing that uh, outside of search networks. So um, this is allowing us the ability to put that product in front of someone in a search setting. Um, fun fact, American e-commerce retailers who advertise on Google currently drive about 85% of their paid clicks from Google shopping ads. Now, keep in mind, we did mention e-commerce. When we say that, we mean fully e-commerce, not a brick and mortar that does a little bit of e-com on the side. Um, so if you are in e-com, and this is where it goes back to how we're really speaking to independent retailers, but some of this does apply to brands. If your brand is big online and that's how you're looking to kind of make a dent um, in the market, you have to go with Google Shop. Moving forward from there, your dynamic retargeting ads. Now, dynamic retargeting ads allow you to show ads to your previous site visitors, but utilizing algorithms and I guess to not get too buzzwordy, um, artificial intelligence, um, which is basically the use of an algorithm to predict someone's decision making or predict someone's likeliness to click on your ad. We're using that type of technology to put display ads in front of people that have already engaged with your site. So with dynamic ads specifically for retail jewelers, we could also take this a step further and put specific product information tailored to that person's previous activity. Now, there's a lot of big words mumbled in there. Let's break it down a little further. What, what are dynamic retargeting ads? If someone visits your site and goes to, let's say the bridal page, because they're getting ready to purchase an engagement ring, they've been in a long-term relationship and they're getting ready to make that next step. Rather than having a pre-made ad, not knowing exactly what part of the site or what part of the page this person was interacting with, we utilize these algorithms to create an ad dynamically based off that person's last touch point. So maybe there was a specific gallery that that person interacted with more than another, or maybe within bridal, they didn't go to the engagement rings page, they went to the wedding band page. These are just different ways that we could kind of bridge that gap between what the consumer is looking for and what your messaging is actually saying or doing. Um, so that's one end of it. On the product side of it, um, specifically if they're on a product page and they're looking at a specific brand over another or a specific type of product. So let's say they're looking at tennis bracelets over necklaces, but they're all within your fashion catalog these dynamic ads are going to put the relevant product in front of that consumer. I do tend to get a little passionate about what I'm talking about here. And that usually results in me talking a little fast. So um, feel free to, again, if I go over something a little too quickly, um, make sure you put that in the Q and a section and uh, we'll revisit whatever we go over. Cause I do realize I, I get a little fast on these sometimes. <laughs> So with that being said, the next thing on our bullet list here is OTT and connected TV data. Now, OTT stands for over the top. The only fact I can't give you about OTT is why it stands for over the top. I have no idea why it's called over the top, but I can tell you all about it. Over the top advertising is most popularly, you know, if we were, to, if I was to give you a good example, it would be Hulu TV. So we're delivering a TV ad. The same content that you would through, let's say, Comcast or DirecTV or any cable subscription, except rather than accessing the content through a cable subscription, they're accessing that content through an internet connection. So they have a Roku installed on their smart TV, which nowadays it's like the, uh, the XM radio of the late 90s, early 2000s. You couldn't buy a car without that already coming installed in it. Nowadays, every smart TV you purchase has some type of OTT platform already installed in it, whether it's Roku or some uh, Apple TV component, whatnot. So we're targeting consumers based off the data that we're able to leverage through their Wi-Fi directly to these connected TVs without the need for a cable subscription. If there weren't so many people on the call, I'd ask for a quick show of hands and see if anyone could guess what the best demographic is for this type of service. But I'll just go ahead and answer that question for you. It is the bridal demographic. Bridal, if you want to say millennials, anywhere between 24 to you could go as high as 54 for second time marriages or first time marriages, let's call it 36. Um, that main demographic is where you see a high influx, influx of viewership on OTT. The beauty of an OTT schedule or an OTT campaign 
is that rather than, and again, we're a full service agency, so I'm not here to talk you out of buying TV if it's working for you, because it works for a lot of our clients. But for the sake of an example here, when you buy TV, you're buying a program based off a rating scale. And that rating scale is going to give you a number of the population that is tuning into that program at that point in time. You're going to use that rating scale to cross your fingers, ultimately, in some cases, and say, well, my demographic is bridal, and this show is, uh, let's call it Say Yes to the Dress on TLC. Um, I'm going to hope that my audience is watching that program, so I'm going to buy this program off that rating scale based off that logic completely flip the script when it comes to OTT. We're not buying the program. We're buying the audience. We're buying the users, the households. So we are building groups of households that based off, again, the data that we communicate through on the Wi-Fi um, channels, we don't know the first or last name of the people that live in this house. We don't know what the address is, but as advertisers, as retail jewelers, we know that there's a person in this household that has been searching for jewelry in my market in the last 90 days through the keywords on Google, the websites that they visit, so on and so forth. So that allows us to deliver that relevant advertising to them straight to their household. So completely opposite of how you would buy TV. Um, but when you look at how the episodes are delivered, it's very similar. Um, when you're watching a reality TV show, this is a really bad example, but it's the one that usually makes people laugh and, and does resonate. You're watching a reality TV show, so-and-so's pregnant. You're about to find out who the dad is. And then guess what? It cuts to a commercial break. They obviously did that on purpose. OTT follows that kind of timing when it comes to your commercial delivery. It's not like when you're watching social media ads or even pre-roll ads, which we'll talk about in a little bit, that can be more interruptive. It's not going with the flow of the commercial break. Um, that's one of the benefits of how we deliver these OTT ads. And it is very similar to a TV schedule. Um, the other thing important to point out with OTT is that you cannot change the channel. And there is no skip button like on a pre-roll campaign, which again, we'll talk about in a second. So OTT, your view rates are typically 98, 99%. The only way someone does not view your 30 second commercial or 15 second commercial is if they back out of the program altogether or turn their TV off. And assuming they are watching a program they're actually interested in, odds are they're gonna sit through your commercial to not have to back out and start it all over again and probably watch through another commercial. So OTT, it's third on our list, but it's just as important as anything else that we're doing. Um, we're seeing a lot of advertisers in big metropolitan markets that are not able to sustain a TV schedule, specifically with COVID and how hard some businesses were hit. Um, this is a much more affordable and efficient option. And again, if not only you're in a metropolitan area, but you're focusing on that bridal demo, that's who you're going to reach through this platform. And we have some more information here to kind of show you. So these are just some visuals. Again, I, I like to keep it conversational. This is just backing up a little bit of what we already mentioned. Um, you know, when you look at how we buy OTT, whereas back in the day or, or even currently, you're forced to X amount of channels. So if you're buying broadcasters, NBC, CBS, Fox, ABC, if you're buying cable, there's let's call it 100 channels. Here, you're not limited to one TV set. You can access this content across endless numbers of channels and, and platforms and literally any device with a screen. Um, a lot of these devices are going back to streaming towards a TV if they're not already on a TV, which means it's not clickable inventory because you don't typically, you don't click or browse the internet while you're watching a program on your TV set. That's something you might do if you're watching content on your phone or your tablet. Um, so we're not optimizing towards click-through rates or conversions after a click. We're optimizing towards view rates. And we'll talk about that in a second. So many screens, unlimited content, again, custom targeting. We're not buying say yes to the dress because it does a 5.6 rating in your market and it drives bridal demo. No, we're buying households that through their Wi-Fi, through their devices are searching for, in this case, let's talk about bridal, bridal search terms on Google, visiting bridal jewelry websites in your market, so on and so forth. And then last but not least, performance and optimization accountability. When we buy a TV schedule, really only looking at reach and frequency. When we create an OTT schedule, when we buy an OTT campaign, there's a little more to just reach and frequency. We're talking about view rates. How did our creative do for this ad rollout versus that rollout? We A-B test that. 
Um, and then for the small percentage that is going to clickable inventory, we could we can look as a secondary factor at your click through rates and whatnot. Again, just putting some visuals and words behind what we've already talked about. If you were to look up uh, in a textbook what the definition of true OTT would be, it is long form professionally produced episodic live and on demand video content streamed to a connected device without the need for a cable or satellite package. It's basically you connect to the internet, you go through your operating software, and then you access the content, the same channels and apps, you see them all right here for the most part that you would access on a uh, cable subscription. And then last but not least, delivered primarily on demand and on the viewer's terms. So another, I guess, comparison to a traditional TV schedule, you wanna buy Good Morning America on ABC because it has a really high rating in your market, but it only comes on from nine to 11 a.m. Monday through Friday. So you're forced to go to that time slot as is the listener or the viewer. So you as the advertiser and the viewer will have to meet at this middle ground. It's almost like an unset agreement for them to view the content that they want and for you to deliver the ad to the person that you want to. That is all thrown out the window when you buy it this way um, because that user is tuning into the content on their terms when they want to. And whenever that time may be, you have the ability to also deliver them with an ad, not because of content they're watching, but because who that person is and what their tendencies are. Cool. So we talked about OTT and connected TV as one of the uh, factors of video advertising that really stood out for our clients in 2020. A couple other things we want to talk about here is pre-roll video and YouTube, pre-roll video inclu including YouTube, as well as the Google Display Network, and how we leverage search engine data from the Google Search Network to maximize campaign performance. There's a lot in that one bullet point, so let's break it down for you really quickly. Google is a website, google.com. Google is also a conglomerate of websites. There's two massive networks that fall under Google's umbrella, Google Display Network and Google Search Network. Your Google search network has everything and anything to do with searches made on Google. So for it to be considered Google search network, the first place you would go to is google.com. There's a search bar, you type something in, ads come up, that's the Google search network. Google also has hundreds of partners that have similar smaller search engines built in. Um, I know Washington Post, for example, is one of them. So there's a search bar in Washington Post to pull up um, recent articles, or it ties you into a separate search network that pulls data from Google. If someone were, for whatever reason, to utilize that, that would fall under Google Search Network as well. Our campaigns rarely ever do any of that stuff with Google Search Partners. I'm just kind of explaining how, it, how the dynamics work out for you. Um, put that to the side, Google Display Network is a conglomerate of over 2 million websites that allow Google advertisers to put their ads on their actual website placements. So this is everything from ESPN.com, again, to WashingtonPost.com, NBC.com. Again, over 2 million websites that allow people on, on their placement. Um, so let's talk a little bit about that. So uh, let's go back to pre-roll video real quick. Your pre-roll video ad is a video advertisement that dynamically plays either immediately before or throughout a featured video on both mobile and desktop. Now, keep in mind, about 80% of video content viewed online is viewed through YouTube. So typically speaking, your campaign, when you run a pre-roll campaign, should be 80, 90, sometimes 100% video delivery on YouTube. We're not delivering ads to people based off necessarily what they're watching on YouTube, although we can manage that. For example, let's say you're targeting, um, let's say you're targeting uh, self-purchasing moms with a high household income. Sometimes their kid is using their iPad and they're watching you know, some type of Disney Channel or whatever child's con uh, children's content, you don't necessarily want your ad playing during that time frame. Some people do because the parents usually behind watching too, but that's just an option. You can limit the categories of videos in which your ads come up on 
But in theory, we're not targeting those categories. We're targeting the people based off what they search for. YouTube is owned by Google. So we're actually able to look at what people search for on Google and then target that same person on YouTube, not based off what they're watching, but based off what they search for. So it's important to make that distinction. Um, going back to how the ads are delivered, again, we talked about the ad playing either immediately before or, or throughout a featured video on YouTube. Um, that breaks it into two categories, your bumper ads and your in-stream ads. Your bumper ads are the non-skippable five to six second commercials that are going to always run before your content. In-stream ads are skippable. Usually after five seconds, there's a skip button that comes up. Um, typically 12 seconds or longer is the best practice, 10 seconds or longer um, for those commercials. And those are going to run in between content. Pre-roll advertising is extremely practical in the sense that running an ad before the user's desired content means that audience is likely still engaged, interested, and willing to sit through a brief six-second ad to get the content they want to see. And again, since they're waiting for something specific, there's a higher chance that they'll watch your ad for at least a few seconds, if not in its entirety. We talked about 98, 99% being very common view rates for OTT. 20, 30, 40, 50% view rates are where kind of where most people fall in line with when it comes to a pre-roll campaign. Very, very dependent on your creative. If you're running all co-op through your pre-roll and you're not really branding yourself, you're not getting creative with the messaging, maybe you carry a big brand and you have a bunch of money you got to spend and you're just running their tagged spots where it's all about the brand for the first 29 seconds and then your image comes up at the end, you're going to imagine those video ads probably aren't going to have as high of a view rate as an original creative video ad that you put together with your agency or your video team, um, talking about you as a store in the market and really speaking to that consumer at that moment, right? And something I, I should mention now that I meant to mention earlier, well, we, whether we're talking about pre-roll video, OTT video, or any other form of video content, when the time comes that you're shooting production for that video content, Always be mindful of the stage in both the buying cycle that the consumer's in when they receive your ad, as well as just the state in which that ad is being delivered to them within the context of, of the platform in which they're seeing it. Someone that listens to an ad on the radio in their car on the go is in a different mindset than someone that's on their couch watching a football game on Sunday morning the same way someone that's watching a video, a cat video on YouTube or a video of what their friends did last night on Facebook, that ad coming in that content is, is it should be tailored to where the person is in the buying cycle, as well as the platform and the context in which that ad is being delivered in that moment. So two things to always remember whenever the time comes for you to kind of prepare for video production and, and really focus on getting video content to represent yourselves as a brand in the market. Last but not least, we talked about the types of video ads and, and the stages in which the consumers are in. Um, the data behind these pre-roll campaigns is what really interests us as an agency and our clients as advertisers that want to be as efficient as possible with their marketing budget. Again, Google bought out YouTube and has a network of over 2 million websites that run video. Um, so as advertisers, we're able to leverage all that data from your Google search campaigns and funnel them into your video campaigns. We could look at people that have engaged previously with your ads, as well as people that Google kind of cups into different categories based off the behavioral tendencies that they've shown while using Google's platforms or any number of their thousands of partners on the internet. I mentioned all those specifics so you can imagine Google has very granular data. Google is a search network. But more than anything, they are a data company. Same as Facebook and Instagram. They are social media networks. More than anything, they are data companies. And although sometimes as consumers, it can get a little scary when you start to think about that. Um, when you really put into the context of what we're doing here, all we're doing is taking an advertiser who in good faith is trying to sell a good product to people who are genuinely interested in them. And we're making sure that the right people see the right product at the right time. So 
when you think of that with your advertiser hat on, um, I think this is actually a really, really good thing. And there's a very um, progressive and efficient way to carry your ad dollars rather than how things were done decades ago, where it was a little more of a, how do you say, throwing darts on the wall and crossing your fingers that things would work um, with very little to no data behind that decision making. So with all that being said, here are some examples of the data audiences that Google allows us to target in addition to people that have already engaged with our own search campaigns. So there's a ton of in-market audiences, meaning people that are showing their in market for these categories based off what they've searched for and the inquiries that they've taken in the last 30, 60, 90 days. Jewelry and watches, fine jewelry, women's apparel, necklaces, bridal wear watches, formal wear engagement rings, so on and so forth. Those are just a few examples. You could also target users based off demographics and affinity audiences. So luxury shoppers, consumers that are in a relationship, have been in a relationship for X amount of time, consumers that are married or recently married, so on and so forth. So it's just important to kind of point that out and, and know all the awesome data that, that that's at hand. Just another thing to point out when you do see your results from your Google, from sorry, from your pre-roll campaigns, keep in mind, if you're running a 15 second commercial and someone hits the skip button at 14 seconds, Google does not classify that as a view. And you only pay per view the same way you would only pay per click on a search campaign. So when you look at your view rate, there's a lot more weight to the percentage of people that are categorized as a view, because those are people that, despite you maybe running a 30 second ad, and for 25 of those 30 seconds, they had a skip button in their face. They chose not to hit that skip button, minimize it, and watch your content through its entirety. Whereas with OTT, everything's give and take, right? You do have a higher view rate, but they don't really have an option. Just things to keep in mind. We always like to put context and, and look at both the yin and the yang, so to say. So that covers our section about what's working. Now, I realize that section probably takes usually a little longer portion of the uh, presentation um, because that's usually what people are interested in the most rather than definitions and just overall, what's this, what's that? Uh, people want to get straight into what's working. So I did dedicate a little more time to that. Um, I'm going to go over some of the, um, you know, overall services that we look at in a media mix and just high level definitions. Um, but being mindful of time here, it is 3.34 Eastern time. I'll send out another reminder. Just please put in your questions if you have any at all. So we could address those accordingly. I'm going to just not breeze, but kind of high level it the remainder of this presentation. Um, and then we could get more into details on any of this if, if you like afterwards. Um, so with that being said, maximize your media mix. What does your media mix look like right now? We took an average of all our clients that have done successfully in the last you know, 12 months, which happy to say um, we have not had anyone significantly down year over year. Um, we did have some that fell short about a point, um, some that fell flat, some that were up a little bit and quite a few that were up significantly. So when we look at all those jewelers and what they did with their marketing in 2020 and moving into 2021 as well, rolling with the punches and adjusting to things that are already behind us and things that we can kind of forecast ahead of us, this is what that media mix looked like. Um, so feel free to write this down, take a screenshot or whatnot, because I think this is valuable information to anyone that's kind of staring at an Excel spreadsheet and thinking, well, crap, I don't know where to allocate these dollars. I don't know where to go. I don't know where to start. This is what I would recommend as an expert in the field. Your SEM and your SEO. SEM is search engine marketing. That equates to your paid ads on Google. SEO is your search engine optimization and is attributed to not only your non-paid ads on Google, your organic ads, but it also is I like to look at it as the umbrella that encompasses your overall digital presence. You have on-site SEO that has to do with all the coding on the back end of your site, making sure we have the right keywords in the copy of your site, making sure all your images are tagged, so on and so forth. Tons of technical jargon there, but just keep in mind there's on-site SEO as well as off-site SEO. 
all your listings, all the uh, places within the internet where people can access your site through a third party, like your Google My Business, your Facebook business profile. Maybe you're a big bridal store. You have a listing on the not.com. All that encompasses your online presence falls under your SEO. Why do we put SEM and SEO at the top? Because search engines are being used more than ever and more and more people are spending time online. Your SEM is your sprint with a good paid search campaign. You could rank number one on the most competitive fields in your market literally overnight. Your SEO is the marathon. It's building the grassroots foundation. So at one point in time, you no longer have to pay for these keywords because over the course of 12 months, You've been, op you've been optimizing towards ranking organically little by little. It does take a lot more time. It's very much so like getting into the gym for the first time. You might check for abs every two weeks, but you and I both know it's going to take a little longer than that. Your SEO is a little longer process. That's your marathon. SEM is your sprint. But when you combine those together, again, not either or, more so yin and yang, they do complement each other and everything else you do, not just digitally, but traditionally. Um, so very, very important. Your mobile display, more and more people are on their mobile devices um, as they browse through the internet. Um, there's very cool things that we could do when targeting people exclusively on mobile devices, um, specifically with the location data that these mobile devices communicate with us. Um, I, most people don't go shopping with their laptops. So if I'm targeting people on their non-mobile devices, I don't have as much access to seeing where they've physically been as advertisers so we could target them. With mobile devices, most apps don't function without some type of location settings refreshing in the background. So again, I don't know what this person's first and last name is. Um, I don't know their social security number or what their tax records are, but I do know that this device with device ID, A, B, C, D, number, 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 um, has entered a slew of competitive jewelry stores in your market in the last 90 days because of that location data. Because of that alone, we put mobile display high up on the list because that's very relevant data that we think should be incorporated into any media mix. Your retargeting, that's a no brainer. We're, we're delivering ads to people that have already engaged with your brand one way or another. We talked a little bit about dynamic retargeting and all the cool things we could do there, utilizing artificial intelligence to take these algorithms and put uh, dynamic ads in front of people in the moment based off specifically what they're interested for. There's other things we could do with retargeting as well. We could do abandoned cart retargeting where if someone is going through a uh, transaction online, assuming you're an e-com advertiser, and for whatever reason, they add the item to the cart, they go through the process, but they don't finish the transaction online. We can now, with a frequency cap, we're not trying to stalk anyone, but we could follow that person around for a little bit with that product. Say, hey, we saw you were interested in this. Um, we'd love for you to take a second shot at it. Um, and then sometimes we could even incorporate a special offer that would only be present on that specific ad that would only be seen by someone that showed interest in that product in the first place. Um, so there's a ton of options and, you know, we could incorporate QR codes, a ton of cool stuff we could do there. Retargeting should be the basis of any media mix. It's very straightforward and it's a no brainer in my opinion. We talked quite a bit about pre-roll video and OTT there, so I'm not gonna get into the weeds about it a second time here. You guys should get the gist of it. Any further questions on that, more than happy to address it here in a few minutes in our Q&A. And then last but not least, under the digital bracket, you'll see there's some more stuff here afterwards, but under the digital bracket of your media mix, audio streaming in the form of Pandora Radio and Spotify is something that has it's not necessarily new, it's been around for a while, but as more and more consumers shift how they view content, advertisers need to be on top of that and shift how they're delivering ads through that content. So Pandora Radio has been, a long, been around quite a bit longer than Spotify, um, although they do have a much larger database of users to reach. They're more so your broad demographic, whereas your millennials, your 25 to 36, 38, um, are going to be on Spotify. Now, there is a trade-off there. Although more bridal users are on Spotify than Pandora, theoretically, um, the data that Pandora is able to provide us is more consumer-driven than the data Spotify provides us. So if you were to put Pandora and Spotify side by side, and you were to gauge the data behind a campaign on each, 
the one thing to note is that the type of data Pandora is going to be providing you is relevant to what that person's more in market for. We could get uh, luxury profile audiences. Um, we could also look at household income and target people within certain uh, geographic areas that make X amount of money or X amount of income or higher per year. Spotify does not focus on that. Spotify is more progressive. So they're looking at listening tendencies. So it's more so these consumers are likely more affluent because they listen to these types of podcasts or they like to listen, they work out at 5 a.m. and listen to this type of music. So likely they're either an executive or they have some type of stature within their organization because that's things that those people typically do. Um, there's a little more connecting the dots because you're using listener data and behavioral data from that side rather than actual consumer data. Um, I do think Spotify eventually ad dashboard hasn't been around as long as Pandora, so they probably just don't have enough to throw around um, when it comes to building campaigns for their advertisers. Um, so stay on the lookout for that. But both Pandora Radio and Spotify, very important, should be a part of your media mix at some capacity. Social media. So social media, obviously, as we mentioned with Google, they're a search network. However, they are the largest data company in the world, if not one of them. Same thing with Facebook and Instagram. One of the things we did want to just briefly touch on with Facebook and Instagram is the use of user-generated content and targeted audiences whenever building your campaigns out. Um, you have the ability to target very, very granularly on Facebook and Instagram with all the information that people put on there. For better or for worse, it's like people's diaries nowadays. I mean, you could really, without ever having met someone, I mean, you, you could know every single person, every single thing about that person if they chose to disclose it, which many people do. Um, as advertisers, uh, we could use that to then, again, we're not being facetious or malicious with what we're doing here. We're, if they're in market for jewelry and we have jewelry to sell, well, let's get in front of these people, right? That's all we're doing. Um, Social media is able to really provide that down to a granular level and put it in front of people um, that are further down the funnel than not. Um, although they may not have specifically just searched for an engagement ring, um, there's a lot of really good targeting tendencies as far as relationship status and, and whatnot that you're able to focus on there. And then last but not least, traditional TV and radio, print and billboard. Those are the four things that when you talk about our really large advertisers, I'm talking about retail jewelers that do, let's say at a very minimum, 10 to $12 million in revenue and up are doing everything on this page. Now, there are some exceptions to it. Let's say you're doing $5 million in revenue, but you're in a rural market, you're the top dog in a market, everything's super cheap when it comes to TV, radio, print and billboard. You might be able to afford doing all of this, but for the most part, um, doing everything on this page is usually going to go towards those higher volume, um, higher revenue, I'm sorry, not volume, higher revenue jewelers. Uh, but nonetheless, a combination of these, you should have some type of traditional presence if you're able to afford it in your market. If you have a 600 square foot jewelry space on you know, Madison Ave in the Diamond District in, in Manhattan or anything of that nature, um, odds are you're not probably spending a million dollars a month on TV in the New York market, nor do you need to reach the entire New York market. But if you have 10 stores spread across the Carolinas and Virginia, and you can afford to really negotiate on your um, local media, and you could use that side by side to boost your online presence, we still see a return in how do I say it? Maybe the top 30, 40% uh, of markets rather than the top five, 10% when it comes to big metropolitan areas. Um, so we're not buying TV and radio as much in those, you know, top big cities, but that middle ground is really where we do see it shine. And obviously if you're in a top 100 market, um, everything's probably so cheap. If you're doing uh, competitive revenue wise, you should be able to afford something there. Um, so with the TV, radio, print, and billboard, I didn't want to make it too much of a focus because there's more and more of a shift towards digital, and that would probably take a few hours in itself. Um, but I did want to make a footnote at the end of the presentation to make sure we talked about um, how important it is and how much it does still work for a lot of our retailers, specifically in those more rural um, markets. So that summarizes our presentation.
quick second, just want to say a quick thank you to Howard, Mike, Carolina, and the rest of the Jewelry Common Centurion family for putting this online conference together. And again, most importantly, thank you to all the retailers who tuned into this presentation. I know this is a really busy time of year because our clients are all going crazy right now. Um, closing out the year, starting the year, planning everything out. So we really appreciate it and wish you nothing but the best in 2021. Thanks, everybody. Howard, appreciate that. Gus, I've taken the platform back from you again. I'll invite anybody to put in some Q&A into the chat and Gus will chat with us and let us know the answers if anybody's got anything they'd like to know. Gus, anything you want to add in the meantime while everybody gets their questions together? Cool. Um, yeah, so I had actually, uh, I, I just took the screen off here, but I had my email up at the end. Um, I just wanted to say if, if anyone um, outside of this has any further uh, feedback or questions or would like to um, discuss anything in greater detail, my email address is gus at bottomlineblack.com and I'm actually just going to type it. In I don't think we're seeing your screen anymore, but Gus at bottomlineblack.com, right? Yep, yep. I was just going to send it to the chat box here. Oh, great. Okay, perfect. So I'll, I'll make sure to drop that in. Um, Yay. Well, we have a few nice messages that people found this helpful and thanking you. It looks like we're good on questions. So we'll say goodbye for today. And thank you, Gus. Great presentation. You've given everyone so much to think about, myself included. Uh, awesome. Well, thank you. All so right. Much. Just drop my email in there again. That's, that's at bottomlineblack.com. Thank you so much for your time. We appreciate it.